Uh, my topic is privatization. If you get an email from me, you'll notice that at the bottom it says, if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. And since everything either moves or doesn't move, privatize everything. That's my motto. And what I'm going to do is make the case very briefly for privatization of anything. And then I'm going to apply it to privatization of roads and streets and highways, which I have a book on, which I make the case for that. Uh, the main reason for starting with that one is a lot of people say, well, but how would we have roads without the government? And uh, the second one, uh, I have a book out now, but it costs like 150 bucks, so I don't recommend anyone buying it. <laughs> uh, it's on why we should privatize the oceans and the rivers and the lakes. And the third book in this series that I'm now in the midst of finishing is why we should privatize the space race and why we should privatize the moon and Mars and stuff like that. Okay, so why privatize anything? Well, there are two reasons. One is ethics and the other is economics. The economics is that we're much more efficient because the only way, uh, there are only two ways to uh, allocate resources. One is private property, and each person decides what to do with his private property. And the other way is through the government. And the private market has many advantages over the uh, government in terms of just about any privatization of anything. For example, uh, the, uh, the time dimension. In uh, the dollar vote, which determines allocation of resources in the private sector, you can have a dollar vote 22 times a day, or every hour, or once a month, whenever you want. Whereas in the political sphere, you can only have a vote every four years or every two years or something like that. So we, the consumers or the voters, have a much more tight leash on entrepreneurs as uh, consumers than we have as voters over politicians. We can crack the whip, so to speak, on them uh, daily or hourly, whereas the other a way we can only uh, have an input every two or four years. Another one is focus. Uh, you can vote for a, a white shirt or a blue shirt or a green shirt or a, or a pair of shoes of purple, whatever. Uh, whereas in politics, it's a package deal. You have to take the, the whole package. I mean, suppose you like Hillary's, God forbid, policies. One. <laughs> One, three, five, seven, and nine, and you like Donald's two, four, six, eight, and ten. You just can't pick. You have to take the whole package deal. Whereas you don't have to take any package deal in the market. You can tick, uh, pick policy one and two and three and four. Whereas in the other way, you either have the odd number or the even number of policies, whatever they are. Another word, another one is uh, from my friend Brian Kaplan, who wrote a book on rational voter ignorance. If you're going to buy a motorcycle, what you're going to do is ask your friends who have a motorcycle or read consumer reports on motorcycles and sort of learn something about motorcycles. Whereas if you're going to vote, you can be a low information voter and your uh, vote counts just as much as a political theorist or a political scientist who spends years studying it. So we can expect much less rationality from a, a procedure where you don't have to know anything and, and you get an equal vote. Whereas in the dollar vote, you get more dollar votes, assuming a free enterprise system, not crony capitalism, you get more dollar votes the more you've contributed to society. Bill Gates gets many dollar votes. I get a moderate amount, and the guy who's pushing burgers at McDonald's gets fewer dollar votes because of the contribution to society in some rough estimate. Okay, so that's the economic case for privatizing anything. What is the ethical case? Well, uh, in the government, it's based on coercion. Uh, uh, in, in the market, every uh, contract, every interaction, every commercial interaction is unanimously agreed upon. I bought this watch for 20 bucks, and there was unanimous agreement between me and the guy who sold it to me. Whereas in um, politics, the winners win and the losers lose. Now, if you agree to be bound by the vote, that's okay for having a chess club, and by the way, there'll be a chess tournament tonight at seven or so. If you're having a chess club and you're having a vote as to whether to meet on Tuesday night or Wednesday afternoon, and you've all agreed to be bound by the vote, well, okay, fine. But we didn't agree to be bound by the US vote. Nobody joined the US club. It's not a club. It's not a voluntary organization. So on ethical grounds, 
uh, it's highly problematic. Okay, why pick the hard cases? Why not pick privatizing the post office or privatizing parks or privatizing um, garbage collection, which are all very good and important things. And there's a whole literature on why we should privatize the post office, why we should privatize parks, and why we should privatize um, garbage collection and pretty much everything under the sun. But my own personality is sort of to take on the harder cases, even though I've contributed to those easier cases as well. Because my thought is that if we can make the case for the hard cases, then it's easier for the easy cases. Whereas if all we do is confine ourselves to privatizing the post office, people will say, well, what about the roads? How are you going to have private roads? OK, so let me start off with private roads. Why did I get into this? Why am I so intent that we should privatize roads and highways and streets? And the main reason is a lot of people die on, on the uh, highways. A lot of people die. Uh, it's, it used to be something like 40,000 a year. It's now down to maybe 35,000. It keeps varying somewhere between 32 and 42,000 a year. To put that in context, only 3,000 people died in 9-11. Uh, in Katrina, only 1,900 people died. Now, every life is precious, and uh, the 1,900 people in New Orleans and the 3,000 people in New York City, uh, it was a, a disgrace and a horror. But this is 35,000 people a year, every year. Uh, uh, there are statistics as to how many people the government kills, and uh, Courtois and Rommel and uh, some other people. Uh, uh, I think in the last century, something like 270 million people were killed by governments. Not in wars, just killing their own people. But they don't count... Uh, highway deaths. If they counted highway deaths, there, there'd be even more people killed. Now, the obvious answer or the obvious objection to what I just said is, well, look, it's not the government's fault. You know, you anarchists, you're crazy. You blame everything on government, and I do. Uh, <laughs> any any uh, problem is the government's fault. I mean, uh, cancer. Cancer is the government's fault because they take half the GDP and waste it. And with the half the GDP they take, they make sure that the rest of us can't be as productive as we otherwise would have been. And had they not done that, we might have been four or five times richer. Maybe we would have cured cancer. I don't say we would have, but maybe we would have. So uh, it sort of comforts me to know that anytime anything bad happens, it's the government's fault. <laughs> and whether it's bad breath or underarm deodorant problems, it's all the government's fault because they take the GDP away and they make us poorer than we otherwise would be. OK, now the obvious objection to what I just said is, well, it's not really uh, the government's fault. It's the fault of speeding, or vehicle malfunction, or um, a drunken driving, or a driver inattention, or anything like that. And my response to this objection is, these are just proximate causes. The ultimate cause is the government. For example, Suppose uh, we find out we're, we're MBA people and we're brought in to find out why the restaurant failed. And we start listing why the restaurant failed. And the reason the restaurant failed, we say, is because of uh, uh, the cook couldn't cook his way out of a, I don't know, <laughs> plastic bag or whatever. Couldn't cook too well. Uh, the waitresses were surly. Uh, they didn't clean the place. Uh, location, they located on a cul-de-sac. And, and we start listing all these reasons. These are just proximate causes of why the restaurant failed. The ultimate cause is the manager didn't hire a better chef. The manager didn't locate the place in a better area. The manager didn't uh, get a guy and give him a broom or something. Let me give you another example. I now take a gun and I shoot it right through that wall and I kill the next guy that walks in front of the Mises Institute. And you all grab me and say, you're a murderer, you're a dirty, rotten murderer. I say, tut, tut, not so fast. It was the bullet that did it. I'm innocent. I, I'm just, you know, <laughs> just, I just went like this. Well, we would see through me, if I made that claim, we would see that the ultimate cause of the murder was me and the bullet was just the proximate cause. So I say that the ultimate cause of the uh, uh, road fatalities is not speeding and, and driving fast and uh, uh, drunken driving and this and that and the other. It's rather the failure of the government to stop this. Now we know that competition brings about a better product. It brings about a better product in wristwatches and shirts and pens and in anything you can imagine. Well, why not uh, in highways? Why not have competition between different road owners to see who can deal better with speeding? 
to see who can deal better with uh, drunken driving, to see who can deal better with um, vehicle malfunction, uh, to see who can deal better with whatever the problems that beset us. In other words, we have a good theory. Competition brings about a better product. Let's just apply it to areas where it had never been applied before. In this, I uh, follow to some degree my dissertation advisor at Columbia, Gary Becker, who started applying economics to areas that it wasn't applied to before he started in much. He would apply it to economics of discrimination, economics of crime, economics of this, that, and the other that hadn't been applied to. So I owe something to him also, although Murray Rothbard obviously is my main mentor in just about everything. Okay, uh, one reason for, uh, one motivation for me for writing about this is the, the number of deaths. And I think that we would uh, reduce deaths by a great amount. Uh, what I did is I extrapolated from other areas where public and private uh, run side by side, say, uh, garbage collection. And what they found out, that in garbage collection, um, the private is about f four or five times more productive per ton of uh, garbage collected. It costs uh, one-fifth or one-fourth or something like that. And there's other areas where government and private both operate, say, in delivering mail, not first-class mail, which is illegal, but in, in parcels and stuff like that. And they find that uh, there's a ratio of two to three to four to five times more. So what I did is I extrapolated and I said, look, if 40,000 people died on public roads, uh, maybe uh, 10,000 would die on, on private roads, one-fifth or one-fourth, something like that. And uh, I was criticized by Larry White on this, and he said, well, you know, um, uh, if that's true, if what I say is true, then government is only responsible, say, for 30,000 deaths out of 40, because if the private would kill uh, 10,000 anyway, the government, you, you can't attribute more than 30,000 to the government. And what I said is, uh, my uh, response to Larry White was, look, uh, they say that Hitler killed 6 million people, 6 million Jews, I think 11 million people. Let's just take the Jews. They killed 6 million Jews, but it took them four or five years to do it. During that four or five years, let's say 100,000 people would have died of natural causes. So is Hitler guilty of only killing 5.9 million? No. He's guilty of killing, he killed 6 million. Just because they would have died anyway doesn't uh, let him off the hook for that extra 100,000. So similarly, what I'm saying is that uh, if uh, 40,000 people are killed by government and 10,000 would have died even under uh, uh, private conditions, because private is not perfect. You're not going to get down to zero deaths if you're going at uh, 70 miles an hour. Uh, you know, people uh, m make mistakes. There's a limit to what competition can bring us. We're not getting into perfection here. So I'm saying that they're really uh, guilty for the, the whole, the whole uh, what is it? The, 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 the full, what was that thing? The, the thing where they had that movie where they stripped down the, the I forget. The, I'm, I, uh, <laughs> I'm being incoherent, but I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to recoup here. Okay, so, wh <laughs> so why is it that um, the full Monty, that's what I'm, <laughs> the full Monty, they're, they're responsible for the full Monty. That was the word I was looking for. I sometimes think I'm going senile, but then I remember when I was in 20s and my 30s, I, I also had these um, <laughs> mental glitches, so uh, I think I'm okay. Okay, so why, how could, suppose I ran a, a, a road. How would I try to save people's lives? And uh, maybe you could think if you had a private road, how would you save people's lives? And uh, we would compete with each other to see. I mean, if, if somebody got caught uh, drunk and driving, I would um, uh, be very draconian about it. Not only take away his car, his whole car, the hell with this $200 fine, but you know, just take his car away and maybe uh, chop off his nose or something. Uh, uh, because uh, drunken driving is uh, very, very serious. And uh, in my road, I'm gonna compete with you and your road and, and we'll see who, who does better. Another one is, here are um, three roads, or rather, uh, three, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, lanes in a road, A, B, and C, and uh, the minimum uh, is 40 on, on the highways, and the maximum is 70, and uh, maybe it's not speed that does it, maybe it's the variance in speed. 
So maybe what we should do, instead of having a minimum of 40 and a maximum of 70, and you know when there's a maximum of 70, everybody's doing 75, or except if you're a little old lady or somebody, hate to be a sexist and an ageist, but what the heck. <laughs> if you're a little old lady, uh, you're probably doing 55. Uh, and there are people that do 40, I mean, uh, if they have a very slow car. And most people are doing 70, 75, sometimes 78. So maybe it's the variance in speed, not the, uh, the uh, average speed. Maybe what we should do instead is have a, everyone has to do 50 here, 65 there, and 80 there. Maybe that would save lives. Do I know? No, I don't know. All I know is that... The, the rules of the road come from Washington, D.C. in one fell swoop, and uh, everybody's got to do the same thing. Maybe this would save lives, and I would try it, and if it didn't save lives, well, then maybe I would try um, uh, 55, 70, and 85, or maybe um, 75, 65, and 55. Is it written in concrete that it has to be 40 to 70? No. In any other field, uh, people could experiment. And, and see which way would reduce uh, deaths more. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is, here is a, a two-lane highway, and what you see is two trucks, and you're in a car over here, and what you're gonna do, if you're like me, is you're gonna try to get ahead of them. <laughs> because what's gonna happen is that this truck is gonna pull out here and is gonna take about 15 miles to pass them. <laughs> And meanwhile, you're going to zip along to try to you know, get out from this roadblock, the moving roadblock. Well, maybe we ought to have a rule that this stupid truck over here, uh, this one is faster, he's got to slow down two miles an hour to let the guy through. And on my road, I might contemplate doing that sort of a thing, giving him a big fine if he doesn't let the other guy get past him so he doesn't uh, block up traffic uh, forever. So uh, and then there's this other thing, maybe it's not speed, maybe it's not the variance in speed, maybe it's this sort of a thing where you have uh, three lanes, and, and here's some little old lady doing 50 miles an hour in the left lane, and uh, here's a car doing uh, 65, and, uh, here's, and what's going to happen is people start wiggling around and, and changing lanes. Maybe lane changing is the thing to watch out for. And what I'm going to do is have a very, very strong fine for people going slow in the left lane because the left lane is the fast lane. So it's these sort of a things. And in this book, I've got all tons of suggestions as to uh, how we might uh, save lives. Another one is if I see a lot of uh, deaths on a highway, I'm going to have a big cross 50 feet high to show every death. Maybe that'll slow people up. I don't know. The, you see, the, the, maybe a, maybe a, 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 a Muhammad uh, thing, or a, what do you call it, the crescent, or maybe a Jewish star, I don't know, <laughs> something. In other words, what I'm doing is I'm desperately searching around, because I don't know anything about this stuff. I'm just an Austrian economist who is trying to apply a competition to an area where it hasn't been applied to. There are experts in, in this field. One of the experts is a guy named Bob Poole, who I really don't like because what he does is he uh, consults for government and he tries to make government roads and NH, and National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, uh, more efficient. And I think that's sort of selling out. I mean, if the, if the NHTSA reads this book and, and finds it, well, my conscience is clear. I'm just saying how private roads would work and if they pick up, fine. But to go and and uh, confer with them and, and be paid by them and you know, try to help them do it more efficiently, I think is um, problematic from a libertarian point of view. Okay, another reason that I want to have private roads is this thing called um, traffic congestion. Now you might not have much of that here, although I was once, I uh, spent the Katrina semester here, and um, I tell you when there's a football game, <laughs> There's a lot of traffic around here. It makes New York City uh, or Los Angeles look uh, pathetic. I mean, people are going in around two miles an hour in their cars because there's just so many people here. So traffic congestion is another thing, and it's not unrelated to deaths because you have road rage, and people are you know, stuck in, in traffic going five miles an hour, and somebody cuts in front of them, and then you have problems that way. So uh, here is a, a rough depiction of traffic patterns. And here is 6 in the morning, 9 in the morning, 12, noon, 
uh, three, six, nine. And here is the quantity of cars that are going. Well, uh, probably at around seven in the morning, it, uh, it, it gets big from seven to nine. And then it uh, sort of filters out here. And then at around four o'clock, it gets really big for eight, four to six, something like that. And then it tails off, right? Traffic congestion uh, pattern. Yes, everyone with me on this? Okay, good. Well, we have a thing called peak load pricing. What's peak load pricing? Well, if you uh, live in uh, uh, Vail, Colorado, the ski resort, do they charge more in the winter or in the summer? Obviously more in the winter because that's where the peak is. And what peak load pricing does is pushes down because the higher the price, the less demand, right? Demand curve slope downward. And in the summer, uh, they have very low prices there because they want to encourage people. And, and people go there for a vacation because you can go on those gondolas and stuff, and it's pretty nice, but not as good as in the, uh, in the winter. Similarly, I used to teach at the College of the Holy Cross in um, Massachusetts. And uh, Massachusetts' uh, peak load is uh, October, November when the trees turn. It's really beautiful. Uh, they turn yellow and green and orange and, well, not green, yellow and orange and purple and also, and, and they, charge, uh, they charge triple the prices for a hotel, which dampens down the, uh, the demand. And in the non-peak load periods, the hotel prices are lower. Uh, you get this thing in, in all sorts of things. Uh, they charge more for dinner than for lunch. They charge more for a movie on a weekend than on Tuesday uh, matinee at uh, you know, three in the afternoon when no one comes. So what you would want from a rational uh, road owner is to charge a lot during the peak, which would push down the peak a little bit. And during the uh, other times of the period, they would uh, uh, charge low prices to increase. So you get some sort of um, flat uh, uh, usage of the road. Everyone with me on this? Uh, and this is the way to go. I mean, if you have uh, gigantic traffic uh, jams, uh, like in Seattle or any of these big cities, what you do is you charge a little bit more, especially for the, the bridges or the tunnels or whatever it is, like the Washington Bridge. You charge very little at 3 in the morning and, and a lot at uh, uh, 6 in the afternoon. <coughs> but what does the government do? The government engages in anti-peak load pricing. How do they do that? Namely, they exacerbate the peaks and the troughs. What they do is they uh, give you a, uh, a monthly pass for the bridge. And if you buy a monthly pass, the price per trip is lower. right? And who is going to use a monthly pass? The guy who goes shopping once a month? No, it's the commuter who goes in every day. So what they do is they give you a, a cheaper price during the peak, which exacerbates the thing. So it makes it even more of a peak and, and more of a trough. So again, the government is uh, screwing up the works, and uh, you know we have to uh, we have to stop them if we want to have rationality in road use. Okay, now what I'm going to do is give a whole bunch of uh, objections to what I just said, and then I'm going to uh, well a whole bunch of objections to what I just said, and. Um, uh, I forgot one more thing. Uh, in my road, I'm going to have chicken races. You know what a chicken race is? Two cars go on the same, and, and whoever veers away is a chicken. And what I would do on my road between 2 and 4 in the morning, I would get all the uh, highways, you know, the, the regular traffic to go elsewhere, but I would have one lane reserved for that. And this is called culling the herd. You know, I mean, people that would do this, we don't want them on the road, and if they, and, and if they, and I could sell tickets because a lot of people want to see crashes, you know. So this would be a, a big part of my uh, road. Um, uh, my, my, well, well uh, not Keynesians. They're it's a little different. Okay, so uh, one objection is. You would have to, if you had a private road, you'd have to stop every three feet and put a, a penny in uh, to pay a toll. That's an objection. 
And when I started writing this stuff, uh, this was in the 60s, uh, the universal product codes were first coming out. There's a universal product code at the bottom of the book. And what I was doing, they were doing it in groceries and in pharmacies. So I was reading all sorts of grocery journals and, and uh, 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 pharmacy journals to find out how this new technique would work. Because my idea was you stick something like that at the bottom of your car, and as you go over a thing, uh, you get a bill at the end of the month, and that's how you c collect money. You don't have to. Uh, uh, first of all, not every private road would be for pay. Some of them would be loss leaders. Like when you go to uh, 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 Walmart, they have a parking lot for you because they want to encourage you to, to go there, and, and the parking is free. Well, maybe the road leading up to Walmart would be free. Who knows? Uh, but if they want to charge you for it, it doesn't mean that you have to uh, put a, a nickel in, in the box every time you pass some guy's house. That would be, that would be crazy. OK, another one is, how would we move from the present situation to the future situation? So here we have a road. Let's say it's uh, um, Magnolia Street right out there. And, and here is uh, the Mises Institute. And, and they have a certain amount of frontage. And here is, um, I don't know, um, McDonald's uh, down the street. And, and here is uh, Auburn University. And some people say, well, the way to privatize is that Auburn would get this amount, and McDonald's would get that amount of the road, and the Mises Institute would get that amount of the road. And this is a crazy way to do it. Because, you know, anyone could set up a roadblock. You know, uh, let's say the McDonald's said, no one can get past my, my road, uh, my spot on the road. Well, this is a, a, a very ludicrous way of transitioning from the present public ownership to uh, private ownership. A much better way would be to say, OK, well, how many people are on, uh, on, the, on this road? Uh, I don't know, uh, say 300 people are on the road. Uh, everybody gets roughly 1 300th. And now we have a corporation, the, uh, the, the road here, uh, corporation. And uh, the majority uh, stockholders, and you can buy and sell stock. And that would be the way that the, the road would, would, would function. So you wouldn't have that problem of uh, stop gaps. OK, another objection is, how could you have private roads without eminent domain? Eminent domain means, you know, the, we're going to come and hear your land, whether you like it or not, and we'll pay you what we think is a fair price. And if you don't like it, you know, tough. OK, so here's the situation. We're in Atlanta, and we want to make a road to San Francisco. And uh, ideally, we'd like to make it as the crow flies straight, or maybe a great circle if, if you want to be fancy about it. Now, how many people own land between Atlanta and San Francisco? I don't know, uh, 100,000, a million? A lot of people own land between the two. Yes? OK. So one way to do it is to buy options. What you do is you go along and you buy this land and you buy that land, but you don't buy the land. What you do is you buy an option to buy the land. So you go to some farmer and you say, Mr. Farmer, I'd like to uh, buy uh, your 10 acres here in a long strip here because I'm going to make a road, say, uh, six lanes uh, of 10 feet each, which is 60 feet, and a 40-foot um, barrier between the two for grass or whatever. So I need 100 feet and I need a mile long. And, but I'm not sure I want to buy it. How much would you sell it to me for? And he says, oh, 10,000 an acre. I say, I'll tell you what. I want to buy an option to buy at the agreed upon price of 10,000 an acre, and I'll pay you $1,000 or $500 just to exercise an option at my discretion within five years or whatever the period is. And then you go along this road, and, um, and you find over here my favorite cartoon character, Cartman. <laughs> and you know Cartman's... Uh, uh, shtick, screw you guys, screw you guys, screw you guys. That's, that's what he says. And uh, you come to Cartman, he says, you know, well, I'm not selling. Tough. Well, you don't have to build the road as the crow flies. You could build the road like this, like that, like this, like this, like that, where maybe the distance here is uh, 15 miles. And one way you could do is to just go along A, B, C, D, E, F, G and try to buy options on them all. And as soon as you run into Cartman, you say, well, I'm not going on that route. And the options are relatively cheap compared to what the total price would be. So um, 
Another way is you announce you're building a road, and, and here are the seven A, B, C, D, E, F, G uh, um, paths that you're going to take, and get the people along there to, uh, to coalesce. And whichever one uh, gets there first, you'll, uh, you'll double the price of the land, or, or something like that. In other words, let them do the work. But suppose that Cartman owns land like that. 15 miles north and south. Now what are you going to do? I mean, Cartman is prohibiting us from building a road. The only way is um, uh, eminent domain or expropriation, as they call it in Canada and other countries. Well, my son and I, Matthew, when his, he was about, oh, I don't know, 15 or 17, we discussed nothing but this for about two years. <laughs> And finally, we came up with a solution, and, the, and I published it as one of the chapters in this book. And came the question, well, he didn't write one word, but the uh, ideas were a mutual uh, occurrence from our discussions. And my uh, policy in co-authorship is to bend over backwards to give other people more credit if there's any question. So I made him co-author, and he objected. He said, no one would believe that I helped. Look, I'm, I'm just a kid. And I said, but is it true? He said, of course it's true. I said, well, I don't care what people believe. Uh, we'll go with the truth. So he and I co-authored an article on this. And then Gordon Tullock excoriated us in an article. And then I wrote a comment back. So I have a little debate going on in this book with Gordon Tullock, who is a very eminent public choice theoretician who loves the government, even though he's so supposedly free enterprise. So what did my son and I come up with? Well, in order to explain that, we have to get into football. What's going on in football? Here is football, and here are the end zones. And, and we have our ball right here, and we want to move in this direction. Where is it easier to move, when we're here or when we're here? Obviously, when we're in point A, not point B, because we have more field to throw, throw the ball or to run the ball, whereas they have a goal line stand, and, and the offensive team is lucky to get three yards in four tries. Everyone into that? Okay, so with that in the background, let's get back to Cartman. And Cartman has uh, 15 miles north and maybe one mile wide or something like that, a patch of land like that. And what, what my son and I decided upon is we'll build a bridge over him or a tunnel under him. And the problem with that is a thing called ad colum. The ad colum doctrine, ad colum, uh, says that if you own a square mile of the earth, you own down into the core of the earth and up into the heavens, right? That's the ad column doctrine, that if you own a square mile, you own, think of an ice cream cone, down into the center of the earth and up into the heavens. This would play havoc with uh, airplane travel, mm -hmm. and it would also prohibit slant drilling. Slant drilling is here are two guys, uh, uh, X and Y, and X goes down and then under Y's land. And uh, this is not allowed. But we are libertarians. We don't care about what the law says. What we care about is what the just law says. And what the just law says, based on uh, uh, people like uh, John Locke and Murray Rothbard and Hans Hoppe, who have done magnificent work on this, is uh, the Ad Colum Doctrine is wrong. Rather, we go for homesteading. Whoever homesteads at first gets to own it. Well, nobody uh, homesteaded uh, 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 300 miles down. Nobody homesteaded, a, uh, well, I, should say, I shouldn't say nobody homesteaded up here. The airplane companies homesteaded up there. So they get to, to go at 30,000 feet without having to drop a dime in every farmer's uh, lot as, <laughs> as, as they go by. So there's nothing wrong with uh, homesteading, digging under Cartman or building a bridge over him. Because the ad column doctrine is wrong, at least we reject it. But the counter argument is, this gets a little complicated, Cartman now knows that we want to build a road and he wants to stop us. So what does he do? He starts digging sticks down and sticks up. So he uh, uh, homesteads first. But the problem is, getting back to the football field, Cartman is in trouble. Where is my football field? Here it is. Here's my football field. The problem is that Cartman has got a problem because he's got 15 miles to defend. All we need is 150 feet wide, six lanes, 60 feet, 40 in the middle, 100, 100 feet. So he can build sticks 15 miles uh, long up to 30 feet or down to 50 feet. All we have to do is go under his sticks, 
or over his sticks. So, and uh, I think now it would cost some money, but the point is, there's, uh, you know, in, in monopoly theory, we Austrians don't count number of competitors because there is such a thing as potential competition. Here is, um, here is my uh, picture of um, California. And in California, there, there was, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> I, I won't brook any criticism. You can criticize my economics, but my art, artistry is, you know, beyond, beyond criticism. <laughs> that, that didn't come out right. Uh, there was a railroad that was uh, playing havoc with the farmers. Uh, they would say, well, we're going to charge this for peas, and then when the pea crop came in, they would triple the price. Why didn't somebody else build a, road, a, a railroad uh, 10 miles to the east? Because there was crony capitalism, and in order to build a uh, a uh, railroad, you had to get the permission of the California State Legislature, which was in control of the railroad in the first place. But the point is that the last, suppose we had free enterprise in California, which is like a logical contradiction, but work with me here. <laughs> suppose we had uh, free enterprise in California and there was this one railroad, Railroad um, J, not K, just Railroad J, and they were playing havoc with their customers and their suppliers and doing all sorts of nasty things. The last thing they want is another railroad. So even the potential of competition would, would slow them down and make them behave themselves. So it's a very similar getting back to uh, Cartman. The last thing he wants is for, to get into a fight with us where he's got a defensive goal line of 15 miles long and, all, and our football is only 100 feet wide. So this is my answer to the objection that we need uh, eminent domain. We don't need eminent domain. We can build roads without eminent domain. And I think that's an important point because uh, libertarians are not really big fans of eminent domain. Okay, another one is uh, privacy. If, uh, if we have electronic charging, well, suppose you want to go visit your proctologist or you're, uh, you're uh, I don't know, uh, you're having an affair and you don't want your wife or your husband to find out about it and, and there are records. Well, you know, you could pay a little bit more for privacy. Privacy is not a right. Privacy is, is, a, is a benefit. It's a positive uh, right, or namely a matter of wealth. So I don't think that that's a, um, a, uh, a crucial uh, a problem or a crucial uh, objection. Another one is um, uh, the blockade. Okay, so here is a road. Here are two roads. And you have a house right there. That's your house. And you buy your house, and now you try to get out onto the road, and the owner of the road says, oh, that'll be a million dollars each. Every time you get in or out, you have to pay a million dollars. Namely, he's trapping you. That would be another objection. Well, right now, before you buy a house, what you do is you get title insurance. What's title insurance? Make sure that the person who is selling you the house is the real owner. And if he's not, the title insurance will make good on, on the, uh, like if somebody else comes along and says, what are you doing in my house? We bought it from this guy, but I own the house. Well, you have title insurance. Well, under a regime of private roads, you would have a thing called access insurance. Namely, you wouldn't buy a house until you found out, you know, what's the deal? Can I get out on the road or not? Or are you going to charge me an arm and a leg every time I get out on the road? Does the road owner have an incentive to behave? Yes, he wants people to build houses on his road. I mean, if it's an empty road with nobody there, he can't charge anyone anything. Empty roads like the road to nowhere, like in Alaska, the, the way the government runs roads is based on who has political power in the Senate. And you have all these roads with no traffic, and then there are other roads that are just tons of traffic. Well, in the marketplace, the, the roads would be built based on uh, uh, consumer preferences, not based on political pull. And uh, there wouldn't be any of this problem of entrapping people on, on, onto their property because they would want you to, uh, get on, to build a house or a factory or something there. And uh, the only way they could encourage you to do it is to guarantee that they wouldn't charge you more than anyone else or whatever the deal would be worked out. Uh, one other uh, objection is the uh, natural monopoly. Some people say, well, there are natural monopolies, and roads are one of the natural monopolies. No, here's this California thing that proves that that's not so, that potential competition obviates all monopoly. The only monopoly, you see, for the, um, for the mainstream, monopoly is a single seller. 
duopoly, there are two. Uh, oligopoly, there are a few. But we Austrians don't look at it that way. What we look at it is there's is there potential competition. The only time there's monopoly is like when Uber is trying to set up in, in some uh, city and they won't let them. Well, that's a monopoly. Or when the, the Duke gets uh, the salt monopoly because he fought the good battle and now anyone makes salt, you have to, you can't make salt unless you get his permission and you have to pay him for it. That's a monopoly. But number of sellers in a free market is not a monopoly. So roads are not a natural monopoly. Um, I had a big debate with Richard Epstein on this um, eminent domain business at the University of Chicago. I forget whether it's in this book or not, but he is a very, very bright guy and very quick. And even though I was right, I had a hard time with him, kept interrupting me. Very pushy uh, ethnic persuasion, my ethnic persuasion. Forget about that. <laughs> OK. Uh, I've done enough on roads, and I wanted to do most on roads, but I do want to talk a little bit about oceans and rivers and lakes and things like that, because uh, as I say, that book is now about 150 bucks, but the way this uh, uh, publisher does it, they want to sell it to libraries. They're depending upon an inelastic demand curve, but in a couple of weeks or a month or so, they're going to come out with a paperback, which will be something like 25 or 30 bucks, and then you know, be more within reason. And I think the Mises Institute will carry it then, but uh, I told them not to carry it now because nobody's going to buy it anyway. OK, so what's going on with oceans? Why am I motivated to write a book that we should privatize oceans, rivers, and lakes? Well, one reason is Katrina. 1,900 people died, and it wasn't Katrina. Katrina didn't hit us. Katrina went 40 miles east of New Orleans into Mississippi, and we just got a little peripheral uh, winds. Uh, you know, a few buildings were knocked down. But uh, it wasn't really Katrina's fault. It was, you'll never guess, the government's fault. <laughs> and, and in this case, it was the Army Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps of Engineers, their um, uh, barricades to keep the water where it's supposed to be uh, just fell apart. Now look, in an ordinary case where the Army Corps of Engineers was running the river and they screwed up this beautifully, what would happen? They'd go broke and we'd get somebody else. See, the market is not perfect, but the reason we have pretty good shirts and pretty good pens and pretty good eyeglasses and pretty good everything in the market is because when we have not such pretty good stuff, they lose money and they go broke and, and the resources go to people who can do a better job. But you don't have that. In Venezuela, you don't have that for anything. In the Soviet Union, you didn't have much of that. That's why those countries were so bad. And again, I'm just trying to apply this uh, insight, a very, very basic uh, economic insight of private property and, and competition and apply it to, to uh, the river. Well, who should own the Mississippi River? Well, similarly, the way I said um, uh, with the roads, um, you know, uh, we wouldn't want one guy to get all the roads. Where do I have that? Um, here it is. Uh, remember I did that road business? Well, it's the same with the Mississippi River. You would uh, make a Mississippi River Corporation. And you would have uh, river ownership uh, shares based on the frontage on the road, uh, on the river, on the assumption that if you had frontage, you were probably using the road. I mean, if we had a God's eye view, uh, perfection, we would know who owns the river, the people who uh, used it. But we don't, so I'm sort of extrapolating here. So the people who had frontage on, on, the, um, on the side of the Mississippi River, or the people who run those boats, or the people who are swimming or fishing or whatever, and now you have Mississippi River Corporation, and if they do a good job, they'll make money, and if not, they won't, and it'll pass to someone else. Why uh, the oceans? There was this great um, movie, um, Star Trek, where our boys in the 23rd century were getting it in the neck from the boys in the 25th century who were more knowledgeable and they were kicking their butt. Why were they kicking their butt? Anyone know? No, no whales. The whales had disappeared. And the 25th century guys liked whales. And, and in the 23rd century, there were no whales. So our boys in the 23rd century had to come back to San Francisco and get a whale and bring it back to the 23rd century so the guys in the 25th century would get off their case. So I'm worried about this. <laughs> and we now have to ask, well, why are whales disappearing? And the reason whales are disappearing is the tragedy of the commons. What's the tragedy of the commons? When you own something in common or when it's unowned, it gets dissipated. Uh, I now have to show you a picture of a, um, of a cow and a buffalo, and, and notice the cow is smiling because he's not extinct. 
and the buffalo is unhappy because he is going extinct. Uh, wait, I have to put horns on these guys. Okay, and, and so here's the buffalo, and here's the cow. And why is it that the buffalo was going extinct? Because you couldn't own them. And uh, you would have, a, a, the opportunity cost of shooting one would be virtually zero, because if you didn't shoot them, you wouldn't have them anyway. Whereas if you shoot your cow or slaughter your cow, you have a very high cost of shooting him or slaughtering him because you don't have him tomorrow and you would have had him tomorrow because it's private property. Well, uh, the whale is just a, a, a buffalo with a, I don't know, there's a fin and <laughs> there's his face. And, uh, and, and <laughs> you better lighten up in your criticism of my artistry because <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> And, and also, uh, the elephant is just a, a cow with a funny nose, and the rhino has got a different kind of funny nose. The, the reason these guys are going extinct is because of the tragedy of the commons. If you don't own it, uh, and, or if it's owned in common, well, then uh, you dissipate it. And if it's owned privately, like the cow was, it never goes within a million miles of extinction. For a while, the alligators or the crocodiles, they were disappearing, and then they were allowed to be owned, and now we have crocodile farms, and people use the, uh, the skin and the meat and whatever. Uh, so the, the trick is privatization. Another reason for privatizing the ocean is what percentage of world GDP is on the land and what percentage of the world GDP is on, on, on the water? And probably it's 99 to 1. It's hard to get statistics on this, but my estimate is that 99% of world GDP comes from the land, and 1% comes from the ocean, and yet the ocean is three quarters of the um, uh, Earth's surface. It's very similar to what happened in the Soviet Union. There, it was 97% uh, of the um, land was uh, publicly owned, and it produced 75% of the crops, and the private holdings were 25%, no, 3%, and produce 25% of the crops. Namely, this is wild disparity between private ownership and public ownership. In the uh, collective farms, they let uh, 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 the, the machinery rust out in the field, whereas if you own the uh, uh, machinery, farm machinery, you would take care of it because it's your livelihood. So that's one reason for privatizing the, the oceans. And, and the rivers and the lakes and, and every uh, aqueous body of water. Uh, I think the title of, uh, of the, the book was something like Privatizing the Oceans, Rivers, Lakes. And I wanted to put mud puddles too, but somehow better heads prevailed and I couldn't get mud puddles in, uh, in the title. Mud puddles are very important because of what the government is doing now. They, they call it a, a water resource. If, if you find a mud puddle and they try to take over your mud puddles, I mean, uh, they're just, the government is, is berserk. And now I realize that, it, you know, privatizing roads and privatizing uh, oceans and rivers and lakes are not on the agenda. I mean, Hillary and Donald are not going to debate the best way to do this, uh, nor will Gary Johnson. I mean, it, it's, it's not on the agenda, but it's important theoretically that we be clear that private property rights are the solution and government is not the solution. Okay, the third book in this series is um, Privatizing Space. Why am I uh, hopped up about privatizing space? Because I am a humanist. I know it sounds like a sexist or a racist, but what the heck, I'm a humanist. Namely, I like human beings, and I like the idea of human beings surviving. And my thought is that the way things are going now, we're going to have a nuclear war, and it would be really nice if we had a colony on Mars and one on the moon so that at least some human beings would survive uh, the Mishagas craziness, that's Yiddish, uh, that, that's going on uh, with governments. And uh, if we had a colony on the moon and the Mars, uh, and, and we had uh, privatization of the space race, or the colonization, we would be much more likely to get it than if uh, the government is doing. I mean, the government, you know, in um, Austrian economics, there is such a thing as um, uh, the structure of production and based on time preference rates. And one of the points that I make in that chapter, it, uh, I have a co-author here, um, uh, Peter Nelson is my co-author in the space book and in the oceans book. Uh, one of the uh, problems we had, uh, we got a man on the moon or some taxpayer on the moon in the 1970s who was premature. Maybe what we should have done is uh, spent more time on rocketry or, or telescopes or whatever. See, just because you get a man on the moon, you, you want to get these things done in the right timing. Timing is important. 
and, and uh, they uh, went prematurely to, to the moon. Maybe if we didn't do that, now we'd have a moon colony. Who knows? I think we would do better uh, with uh, private uh, rather than public. So to summarize, uh, if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. Since everything either moves or doesn't move, privatize everything. And think in terms of privatizing not the easy things like uh, the post office or the sanitation, which is important, but think in terms of uh, you know, uh, more radical privatization. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>